Hey, um, I had the privilege yesterday of uh, baptising a, a eight-year-old, is he eight? Eight-year-old boy. Uh, was, yeah, you know what? That, thank you, Daniel. It's awesome. It's, isn't it funny? We, 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 I, don't, I don't know everybody that walks into a church, but sometimes I wonder if I walked into a church for the first time and somebody said, hey, such and such gave their life to Jesus, and everybody went, Geez, sounds exciting, doesn't it? I can't wait to do that. Anyone else want to, anyone want to get baptised now after a response like that? <laughs> now, these are exciting things. This is real life we're talking about. And this young eight-year-old boy, his parents rang me up and said uh, uh, a, couple, a couple of months ago, and said, our son wants to get baptised and uh, he's wondering if you would come and do it for him. So we said, yep, would love, love to do that. It's a very powerful thing, baptism. And so we rocked up yesterday and, of course... Um, before I baptise anybody, I'll, get them, I'll ask them a simple question. Why, why do you want to be baptised? You see, in today's church culture, someone like me or somebody else might stand up and go, bow your eyes, close your head. Um, is that right? Bow your eyes, close your head? Now, bow your head, close your eyes, and I'll just you know, wait till I've got you on that emotional, pivotal moment, and then I'll say, hand up if you want to give your life to Jesus, and I'll get you to put your hand up when nobody's looking and nobody notices and, uh, you know... Um, then, then pull your hand down real quickly before anybody opens their eyes. It's almost like I'm trying to protect you from the fact that you're, so, you're following Jesus. It doesn't kind of make sense, does it? If you cannot openly and publicly in front of believers say, yes, I've chosen to follow Jesus, what hope do you have out there in, in the world of standing for Christ and living for him? Yeah? Amen? That's why we don't really do here very often, if ever, close your eyes, bow your head, and, and let's do this. Pro- no, no, no. If you want to follow Jesus at some point... At some point, it's got to be public. At some point, people have got to know and are going to know and are going to find out, let your light so shine among men in the midst of men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father. The premise being they understand who your Father in heaven is so they can give him the glory for the transformation and change in your life. So I always ask them when I baptise people in front of the crowd and everybody that's here, can you tell me why you want to be baptised? And without hesitation without flinching, and over half of the people present, at least a half, probably more, are not followers of Jesus. And this eight-year-old boy, without batting an eyelid, said, because I want to follow Jesus in my life. And I thought, wow, isn't that interesting? Here's a young boy, eight years of age. Now, some of you could be sitting there going, well, it's easy when you're eight, isn't it? I mean, it's easy when you're eight because you don't understand the consequences of people knowing you're a Christian. You don't understand the consequences of what, or you don't know what people think because you're a kid. So they'll still go, oh, good on you. Isn't that great? But if you said that when you're 25, they'd say, you're a jerk. You're an idiot. What the heck have you done? You don't understand. He was only eight. But isn't it interesting? I, I, I was thinking about this yesterday. When he did that, I thought, you know, there's something, there's this thing called the fear of man. There's this thing called the fear of man, and we're going to have a look at a, a, a passage here in John. We finished with it last week, and I want to keep uh, on, this, on this theme, John chapter 12. We're going to go there in a second, verse 42, 43. You can whack it up for me if you want, Bailey. But this thing called the fear of man, isn't it interesting that children don't seem to have the fear of man? Anyone, notice, anyone got kids and notice that they don't seem to have too much fear of man? If they want something, they don't give a rip who's in the room. They're going to scream for it. Amen. They don't care. They don't care if you're embarrassed. If you're embarrassed, they don't care. They'll throw their fist. They'll chuck. They'll do. They don't care what anybody else thinks. If they want to go to the toilet, they'll just do it. They don't care whether there's porcelain around their backsides. They don't care if people are looking. They don't care. They're just going to do what they're going to do because they don't fear man. They don't care what anybody thinks about them. But as they get older, isn't it interesting? It gets to this point where all of a sudden they start thinking, well, what will other people think? It's, 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 it's interesting, you, you, you know, some children, and children are really good at this, and I know you are kids, so I'm pointing you out here. Butter wouldn't melt in your mouth at church. You look perfect. You would never do anything wrong. You always must obey mum and dad. I think your parents have got the easiest job in the world parenting you because you're just little angels with halos and so on. But mum and dad are sitting there going, yeah, but you should see them when you're not around. You should wait till we get home and you look at the way they carry on when nobody else is around. So there's this point, this point where we start, the kids start to work it out, don't they? And they start to learn. 
what they can and can't do in this environment and that environment. And in a sense, I guess fear of man is like that too. It's almost like we're not born with it, but something happens as we go through life and all of a sudden we, it's almost like we learn to care more about what people think of us than we do about what God thinks of us. It's a learned behaviour. Well, if it's a learned behaviour, it can kind of be unlearned too. This is the good news. I think we can unlearn and break free from some of that stuff. Now, last week we finished with John chapter 12, verse 42 to 43. And we were talking last week about living a life that gives glory to God. Amen? There's going to be glory attached to your life somehow. You're either going to live a life that stands in front of the world and says, look at me, look at me, look at me, aren't I great? Everything I do, isn't it awesome? Look how wonderful I am. And you're going to take that glory and you're going to take it on for yourself. Or you're going to live a life where we deflect that glory to God. And we looked at a a bunch of passages, and if you weren't here last week or whatever, you can go onto YouTube, have a look. But we looked at some biblical uh, examples and some writings of these ancient writers and things they said where it's very, very unequivocally clear, God created me for his glory, not for my own. God made you for his glory, not for your own glory. Now, that does not mean that we are just this dust on the ground that doesn't matter and, you know, we should walk around with our heads down going, woe is me, I'm a worm but a man. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. Because the irony of it, the beautiful thing about it is when we see people that live for the glory of God, God tends to put glory on them, doesn't he? When we live to glorify God and lift up the name of God... God tends to reciprocate that blessing and those people end up being quite blessed themselves. So it's not about God saying, I want you to just melt into the floor like the wicked witch of the West. I'm melting! Ah! And all that's left is your pointy black hat and a broomstick. No, no, no. God, God, God wants to honour you. But what he's saying is, don't live to honour yourself. Let me honour you. And the way that I honour you is I honour those that honour me. Live to glory God, live to bring glory to God, to deflect to God. Ultimately, to glorify means to to get people to speak well of and to think highly of. I'm not living to get people to speak highly of and think highly of me. I hope you do, by the way. I don't want you to not, but it's not the object of my life. I want you to think highly of God. I want you to, to, to see God in the things that I do and so on. And I'm not perfect and no one in this room is, but the idea is I'm trying to point this. See, we live in a world that is falling apart. We live in a world that is ever-changing. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God loves us and he loves the world and he has solutions and answers to questions and so on. The, the, the answer to every question and problem mankind will ever have is going to be found in Jesus Christ. It's just that simple. That's what I believe. There are nuances and all kinds, but at the end of the day, black and white... If you want life, you need Jesus. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you may have life, and not just any type of life. I want to give you this thing that Jesus himself called abundant life. There's a big, dis- big difference between existing and living. And Jesus didn't, God didn't create mankind to simply exist. He, it's not like God didn't have a plasma screen TV, so he created man and said, oh, what you got? <laughs> Won't that be fun? Now, he actually loves us and he's got great things in store for us. But we were created ultimately to give glory to God. And in John chapter 12, we've got this story about, and it's a summary, John summarizing everything that is written about the ministry of Jesus. From this point on, you begin to see the narrative where Jesus starts to go to Jerusalem. And the back end of John is basically about him going to Jerusalem, going to the cross and so on. So in John chapter 12, the writer takes this opportunity to kind of summarize where he's at. Here's what's been going on throughout the ministry of Jesus. He says, yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. Many of these influential people believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith Why? For fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue. They didn't acknowledge because they were afraid of being put out of the synagogue. Now, we don't fully understand what that means, but to a Jew in that day, it didn't mean just being kicked out of church. That's what we would kind of think. Some people here probably would love me to kick you out of church. You'd have an excuse not to come. But it wasn't just about that. They'd be excommunicated from the life of the synagogue. Anybody in the Jewish community had to stand a certain distance away from them, couldn't come near them, and this was for a period of 30 days. And then the second level of excommunication, and and some theologians and historians will say there were three levels, but it ends with complete and total uh, uh, removal from the community of the Jewish faith. So it would be like, not only am I going to kick you out of the church, but no one in this church is ever going to speak to you again. 
And if they do, they will be kicked out as well. So when we, 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 we read this and it says that they were afraid of being removed from the synagogue, it wasn't about losing a building to go to on a Sunday, it was about losing community. That's what it was about. We will lose this community. We'll lose this community. But why were they afraid? It says the root reason why. Because they loved the praise of humans more than the praise of God. They lived for praise from people. They wanted to be talked up by people. They wanted people to look at them and say, aren't you great? You believe the right things. You look the part. You dress the part. You say the... You, you. That's what they wanted. But even though they believed... I mean, we're talking about believers here. It's very clear. They believed in Jesus. So we're talking about people sitting in church who come to church on a Sunday, worship God, love God, but out there they will not allow anybody to know that they are associated with Christ. Why? Because they don't want to risk losing that praise out there. Because that praise out there from man has more value to us than the praise of God. We should be living for an audience of one, I heard somebody say once. But the truth is we don't. We live for an audience of many and we hope the one's happy with that. But we're talking here about a bunch of people that missed out on what God had for them. Why? For one reason, because they actually feared man. They preferred the praise of people. Here's a question for you. When you're in a situation where you need to choose between the invisible praise of God or the visible praise of man, what do you do? What do you do? What runs through your mind? What runs through your heart? What overtakes your next action, your next word, your next moment? What happens in those situations? See, here's the thing about the praise of man. See, whatever you get through the praise of man, whatever you feel you're getting, and and this is the thing, I can't tell you what it is, but on the inside of us, we feel like we're getting something in that moment. In that moment, we've got an opportunity. We're, we're, we're in that situation, and right now, my next word, my next action, the next thing I do, I'm going to get praise from somewhere. It's either going to be praise from God and what's that going to give to me or praise from them and what does that give to me? And I make a value judgment, don't I? And so often we go, well, what they're going to give me is going to be better for me, more fulfilling or more valuable than what God could possibly give me in this situation. So I'm going to go over here and shut my mouth. Or I'm not going to associate myself with God or with Christianity or whatever the scenario might be. In that moment, we're making a value judgment. Who has the capacity and potential to bring the most fulfillment into your world right now? Who's going to bring the better stuff into your life? right now in this moment see whatever you get through the praise of man you'll need to sustain it through the praise of man it's never enough now we need more now we need more now we need more but here's the reality whatever you get through the praise of man you'll need to sustain through the praise of man which eventually leads to you becoming a slave to the fear of man you eventually become a slave to the fear of man because you give in to the fear of man You seek the praise of men, and the more you seek the praise of men, it's almost like you dig a hole deeper and deeper and deeper for yourself, and you get to this point where then you've got not only this, is it hard to climb out and go, hang on a second, that hole I put myself in is not really me. I actually don't really think that way. I don't really live that way. That's not the real person I am. That's the person you want me to be. That's the person I feel like you're really uh, liking and the one you're praising. So I'll keep going down that rabbit trail and keep presenting myself as that person because I love what it gives me. But the further down you go, the harder it is to bring yourself back out, isn't it? Sometimes I wonder whether the best thing anybody could do is the minute they give their life to Jesus, get on Facebook and go, hey, all of my friends, I want you all to know this. I've just given my life to Jesus Christ. Yes, that ancient myth, Casper the Friendly Ghost, whatever you want to call it, I've just given my life to him and I'm associating with him. I just want you all to know, let's get it right out there straight away. But then maybe, maybe then they'd look at your life and you'd feel like you're more accountable with the decisions you made from that point on. I don't know. But sometimes I wonder whether that would just might take the pressure off. Because I know a lot of believers, and they're one thing over here, one thing over here, and you can see the tension on the inside. When I come to church, you know what? With all my heart, I want to give glory to God. I really do. I want to glorify God in this place. I'm going to worship. But then as I get out in this other crowd, and all of a sudden it's kind of clamped down a bit, and I, I, I just... Eh. And you almost feel like you're two people. I wonder whether we've settled the issue. Whose glory are we going to live for? There's this interesting thing in Revelation and and, and John in the island of Patmos, this disciple of Jesus gets put on the island of Patmos because he follows Christ. It was a punishment, like a prison. And while he's on there, he has his vision and he writes it down and we call it the book of Revelation. It's actually a vision that this follower of Jesus had. He wrote it down, we call it Revelation. Slip it in a book we call the Bible, which is actually a collection of ancient documents historical documents. 
from men, women, people that had encounters with God, knew about God. And he talks about this church that's lukewarm. Anyone read that? And he goes through these seven churches and there's this one church thing might be later to see it. And he says, you know, you guys are lukewarm. Because you're lukewarm, I don't really have a choice. He uses this violent language. He says, I'm going to have to spew you out of my mouth. Basically because I don't know what to do with you. Now, if you look historically, Laodicea had a very bad, the city itself had very bad water supply. So it used to get its water from two cities. I think it was Colossae and Hierapolis, I think, were the two cities. And the, and the Roman aqueducts, they aqueducted the water down. So I think Colossae might have had really good I think it was Colossae that had the really cold water coming up from the springs, and Hierapolis, I think, they had hot springs. And so they had hot and cold water coming down, but by the time it got down to Laodicea, the water was actually lukewarm and wasn't very good. It wasn't very tasty. It wasn't very useful. I mean, you can do something with hot water, can't you? Make a nice cup of coffee, a nice cup of tea, or, you know, pour it on ant nests if you're a little kid, if you do that sort of stuff. Oh, all the, oh don't tell me you never did it when you were young. Cold water, you can do something with too, can't you? Make a nice smoothie or, a, you know, nice cold whatever, a cordial, whatever you do, you know. But lukewarm, there's not really much you can do with it. Lukewarm water is actually the kind of water that the most bacteria can thrive in. The colder it gets, it can kill stuff off, hot it can kill. But lukewarm, apparently that's where the most bacteria and stuff thrives. And maybe that's what he's saying. If you're lukewarm, it's like you've got this bacteria that I can't digest. I can't do anything with it. And he says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to kind of spew you out of my mouth. I wonder whether the root cause here, I don't know, it's not written there, but I wonder whether part of the cause here was, guys, whose glory are you going to be living for? Whose glory are you going to live for? We're living in interesting times, aren't we? Church used to be okay. It used to be cool. Still is in some places, you know, it's pretty cool. You get up and you win an award in America and you get up and go, I want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I'm sitting here with my three girlfriends that I'm going home with tonight. I want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ. It's just not trendy here in this country, though, to associate with Jesus at all. We're not there. We don't thank Jesus for everything. We don't talk much about Jesus. And we know that there's a cultural movement at the moment that's kind of separating uh, Christianity. There was, once upon a time, there was this big playground. And the playground was shared by the church and the world, and we all played together on this swing set. And probably about five or six years ago, somebody came in with a bulldozer, and they bulldozed down the entire playground. And the church had to build their own playground over here, and the world built a playground over here. And the world says, you can come and play in our playground, but you've got to think like this, act like this, be like this, be okay, you know? And so a lot of people want to jump over there and play in that playground because we don't want to stay in this playground because nobody wants to play with us over here in our playground. Our playground's not cool anymore. It's almost like the grey spaces that we danced in together are, are separating now. And it's almost like God is saying, you know what, I'm, I, I'm, and I am not... If anyone ever says to you, Jesus is coming back here, run them all. They've got no idea. If Jesus himself says, the Father knows he hasn't even told me, I don't think God's going to tell you. Okay? So I'm not saying he's coming back soon. But it's funny when you get ready for a wedding. I might be sitting here with a whole bunch of people. When we start to get ready for the wedding, you know what happens? The people going to the wedding, they go and get changed and they put on their nice clothes and they put on their smelly and their makeup and all that sort of stuff. And, and it's almost like those people begin to separate themselves and there's this distinction, this difference. And I feel like we're living in a time where that distinction and that difference is there. It's starting to become more and more evident in our culture and in our nation that we're either going to follow Jesus or we're not. We're prepared to follow Jesus and we're prepared for whatever comes with that. We're prepared to lose the praise of man because we just may lose the praise of man, but we'll never lose the praise of God. In fact, as the praise of man's voices diminish in our ears, the praise of God starts to ring louder and louder and louder and he looks down and he starts declaring over our lives, well done good and faithful servant. That's what I'm living for. That's what I want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Um, here's a reality. Nobody's ever going to love you as completely and authentically as God himself. Think about that for a second. Nobody. Nobody. Not your husband, not your wife, not your children, not your mum, not your dad. And they all, we all love with the best capacity we can as human beings. But our greatest capacity to love falls way short of the love that's described here from God to us. Nobody will ever love you more authentically and completely than God the Father does right now. And I'm saying that and you might be sitting there and thinking of all these different things, but you don't know what I've done and so on. Hey, it doesn't matter. He knows what you did. You know, not only does he know what you did, he knows when you did it, why. You're probably sitting there going, I did this once, I can't remember the time of day. He, he can. 
I don't really know why I did it. How many times someone does something dumb and you go, why did you do it? Oh, I don't know. He knows, even if you don't. Because he judges the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. He understands all that stuff. Yet that God loves you completely and authentically with everything right now. He loves you. So why is it that we so often abandon ourselves to the judgmental ideas of men and not to the unconditional love of God? Why is it that we still seek the praises of people over and above the praise and acceptance of God? It's weird. The praise of man is so fickle. And the more you get it, and the more you get comfortable with it, and the more you want it, it's like this thing, it's like getting on a hamster wheel. You chase, it's like a drug. You just need more and more and more and more. And when you can't get more and more and more, you feel diminished inside, like, you've, oh, I need more, I need more. You know, it's funny. Uh, we, we did the sound desk a few weeks ago, and I, I, I've forgotten all about this. But I found a letter in my drawer. We used to have a, a, a guy went to a church. Uh, he, he came here. And uh, I remember um, uh, he wanted to meet with me and said, look, I'm, you know, uh, I don't like your preaching, bottom line. I don't think you preach good. I think your preaching is this and preaching is that, and I'm out of here. And I said, that's, that's fine. I, I agree with you. My preaching is not that great. So <laughs> if I wasn't the pastor, I'd probably leave too. But anyway, I'm here. I'm here, and it's my role, okay? Anyway, but what was really interesting was when we, we moved everything forward to build the sound desk there, uh, sorry, when the windows were going in, my desk got moved in the middle and I was putting it back the other day and, and, and this is probably four months after this conversation with this person, I opened my drawer and I found in the drawer a letter and I opened up the letter and so funny, the letter was from that same person and they'd given it to me four months earlier and the letter said, I've been sitting on this for so long but I just don't know how to say it to you so I thought I'd write it down. You are the greatest preacher. I just think you're amazing. I love the way you preach. I'm looking at what? What? How, how can I? The praise of men is so fickle. Someone's going to come up to me today and go, that's an awesome message, Al. And then next week you're going to be sitting next to somebody else going, that, he preached. That was terrible today what he said. What did you reckon? It was, wasn't that great, you know? The praise of man is a fickle thing to chase after, yet how many of us live for it? How many of us still think that it's, it's the praise of men that we need that's going to fill the gaps, the voids, the holes in our lives? Here's what I believe. I believe that God wants to do amazing things in the earth. Anyone believe that? Five, five people. That's okay. I'll like, do the numbers count. One day, one day, this is my prayer, Lord, one day I'm going to say that and 90% of the people are going to go, yes. And I'm going to go... Lord, take me to heaven right now. My job is done here. I believe God wants to do amazing things on the earth. But I also believe that he wants us to be fully committed to him. God wants people that are living for his glory. God wants people that, that count the cost. You know, I've sat with people who wanted to give their life to Jesus, right? At, at, at churches where you do altar calls and hands in the air. Oh, I've been a part of them, passed it in them. And, and I've sat with people afterwards who put their hand in the air and I've actually talked them out of the decision. Because I've actually asked them, do you realize what you're doing right now? Why do you want to give your life to Jesus? And they actually have no idea. I just cried. It was really emotional and it just felt really good and I feel like this might be a good idea. What's the good idea? What are you responding to here? Here's what Jesus did for you. Now I want you to go away and think about that. And, 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 and come back in a week. And you tell me if you really, you know, I mean, the truth is you can walk out the door and pray to God and you don't even need to come and talk to me. You can do it at any point that you want. But if you're going to do it, understand what you're doing. See, when I came to Jesus, here's what I, here's, here's, here's what I believe I did. I got, I opened the door of a passenger seat of my car and I said to Jesus, you get in and you sit there. I still steer the wheel, don't I? I still steer the wheel. Jesus doesn't take control of my life. Jesus is not, there's no hand in the back of my mouth right now like a puppet doing this. Da, 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 da. If he did, it would be way better preaching than what I'm giving you. Huh? Jesus doesn't take control of my life. He sits next to me and he tells me where to go. And he gives me the instruction, turn left here, turn right here. But he doesn't make me do anything. When I gave my life to Jesus... I knew that I would still be in control of the choices, the decisions, the daily things I do. But what I understood was no longer is that going to come out of my own intellect, my own emotions, my own feelings, what I think is best, what culture says, what's popular, what's famous. What's, uh, it's not that. It's now going to come from what God says to me through his word and through his Holy Spirit on the inside of me. That's what I gave my life to. That's what I gave my life to. And that's what God wants from his people. 
And I wonder, I actually wonder this, how many moments do we miss out on glorifying God because of the fear of man in our lives? How many times have you had an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation with somebody? You didn't plan it, you didn't make it happen, but you know you're sitting there and it comes up. Anyone have those moments? See, I think that's how God works. I don't think God says, Alan, force your way into this person's life. Go and be one of those rude, obnoxious Christians who just forces their way in and makes... I don't think God works like that. I think what God does is God goes, you know what, you follow me, you love me, you be, you, you, you be a worshipper of me, you have a heart, and you know what, I will actually put you in those places and you'll be amazed at some of the opportunities that open up around you. But when that opportunity opens up, guess what? I have a choice, don't I? I have a choice. And we know deep in our spirit when those moments happen. We can kid ourselves and say, I didn't. But you know how you know? Because when you walk away, there's this little thing inside you going, gee, I wish I should have. I probably could have. If you've got, you know what? That's probably because you were standing in a moment and God was handing you a divine invitation saying, hey, you don't need to be a rocket scientist or a great theologian, but maybe you could just simply say, no, I actually believe God's good, not bad like that. Or... You know, yeah, there might have been some stuff done wrong in the church and, yeah, you don't want to go. But, hey, sports coaches have done wrong things too. How come you still play sport? Church is not a unique environment where people... It just happens that people don't like the Judeo-Christian worldview. So if something happens in a church, we want to tell everybody about it, if it's negative. But, hey, that sort of stuff happens in all kinds of realms of society, doesn't it? But the church gets... We, get, we cop the flogging for it. But we get a chance every now and then to speak a bit of truth and some, but we, we stay out of it. Because if I said that, maybe someone would turn around and go, what, are you one of those Christians, are you? And guess what? Then I might have to go, <laughs> yes, I am. I'm actually one of them. <laughs> maybe that's what God wants. I wonder how many opportunities to, to, to share the gospel with people we've missed because we knew the invitation was there, but we were afraid what they would think. We were more in fear of what they might say or do than in faith of what God might do. How many opportunities have we had to potentially pray for a sick person, but we pulled back, we felt that thing, we, we saw it, it got our attention, because God's faithful in that, He's, he, he, we know, and, 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 but instead of stepping into the space and going, can I pray for you, we held back, and we did nothing, because we were more worried about in fear of what they might say or do than in faith of what God may potentially do, and what glory God may get out of this. We're protecting ourselves, and sometimes I think we're protecting, we're not protecting ourselves, we're actually holding ourselves out of being involved in a moment that can bring great glory to God. Great glory to God. How do you want to live your life? Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. I love that image of the fear of man being a snare. Here's the thing. I used to, uh, w- one time I was on a, a camp, I might have shared it before, uh, uh, I was at Mudgee High School and uh, uh, they, I found out they had a cadets program, army cadets at school. Anyone ever do army cadets at school? I did it for two days. I found out on Thursday that the cadets were being chucked in a bus, driven to the middle of the bush and kicked off the bus for 48 hours with no parental supervision. We were 15 at the time. Can you imagine them doing that today? 15, and we're thrown out there, we've got axes and knives and everything, 15-year-old kids in the bush by themselves, see you in two days. We were dumped out there, but I heard about it Thursday. I went home, I said to my dad, Dad, you've got to sign me up to Army Cadets, and it's got to be before 9 o'clock tomorrow morning because I'm on that bus and I'm going out bush. So I did, I went out bush and we weren't allowed to take food or nothing. We had to catch our own food. We had to build our own hutchies to sleep in, all that stuff. No mattresses, sleeping bags, nothing. And thankfully, praise God, I had this mate called Rocker, this young fellow called Rocker. And Rocker packed his bag with steaks and sausages and all kinds of things. And we made sure we set up camp way away from everybody else. But we had a feast that weekend. Nobody else caught anything. But we did actually catch one thing. We set a snare around a, around a thing and we caught a rabbit. We built a a, a little thing and we caught a rabbit in a snare. And what amazed me about the snare, what I've never forgotten, is that you can have a certain amount of freedom within a snare. A snare doesn't kill you, but it limits you. You can hop around for a bit. That rabbit got that thing around his neck and all of a sudden there's the hole. He's hopping along and then... Hey, but if you want to play around in here, go your hardest, Mr. Rabbit. Enjoy your life. Just do not go outside where the snare allows. That's what the fear of man is like for people. 
I believe everybody in this room, we want to glorify God with our life. I have no doubt. I'm looking at a bunch of people that I know. Some I don't, but I'm just believing in faith that you do. We want our lives to glorify the one that saved us. We want our lives to point people to Jesus because we know that Jesus can help them way more than we can. We want that. But some of us are trapped by this snare. We get to the edge of that moment and that fear of man grabs a hold of us. And I wonder how many miracles have we held ourselves back from being a part of because we're more worried about what people will think than what God will think. We're more worried about losing our own reputation or being considered a crazy Christian or a weird, spiritual, fruity person <laughs> instead of going, well, it doesn't matter, God. That, 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 I, I really don't care what they all think, Lord. I, what really matters is what you think. If I could break free, imagine living a life where you broke free of that. Where every day you laid your head down at night and knew that you took every invitation that came your way to glorify God, to point people. Imagine living that kind of a life. Imagine what that would feel like. Imagine the joy that you would feel. Imagine the opportunities. Imagine God looking down from heaven going, every time there's an opportunity. When my kids were younger, I used to ask them, would you guys go and mow the lawn? You know? and, and, and anyone got kids? Anyone ever asked their kids to mow the lawn? Anyone's kids actually ever do it for you? A couple of you, okay. Well, quite, most of the time in my house, it didn't happen. And you know what happened after a while? I just stopped asking them. You know why I didn't ask them anymore? Because I knew they wouldn't do it. Doesn't mean there wasn't a bit of cajoling and some leather therapy, perhaps. But I stopped asking. Why? Can't be bothered. When I was at Dan Murphy's and I was a manager at Dan Murphy's and we had a shift to fill, I would go through our list of 20 casuals and I'd ring this guy, oh, no, I can't make it today, I'm at the beach, oh, I can't make it, I can't. And then somebody would say, yep, I'm in, and they were the sixth person on the list. You know what happened the next day when somebody called in sick, couldn't make it? You know who I rang up? Number six on the list. You know why? Because they say, yes. And the next day, yes. And before you know it, that casual was getting away. And everyone else going, why am I not getting hours? Why am I not... You didn't want them. And I wonder how many of us, if we were to sit down with, with the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we'd sit down and go, why am, I, why am I not seeing people healed? Why am I not getting a chance to tell people about Jesus? Why does nobody, none of my friends come to faith? Why do I? And I wonder, I wonder, 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 just speculating here. wonder whether he might not look and go, well, every time I asked you to do something, you said, Well, Lord, so you still got to get mowed, so I still got to fill the shift. And I've got plenty of people that will do it. So I'll just move on to them. And I'll ask them. Wouldn't you love to be that person that was sixth on the list? That every time Jesus said, Here's an invitation, he came straight to you because he knew. You're in a room with 20 people, but he goes, No, no, no. I know Keith is going to do it. So I'm going to give this divine invitation to you, Keith, and go, Would you speak up? Would you pray? Would you help this person, would you, whatever, because we're not afraid, because Keith is not afraid of what people think, and she doesn't care if people know that she follows Jesus Christ, because it's not just a part of her identity, it's who she is, a disciple of Jesus.